Thank you for joining us on another edition of Against the Current, coming to you from the Skyline Club atop the Old Republic Building in downtown Chicago. Pleased to have as my guest on this installment, Cook County Commissioner Richard Boykin. Commissioner Boykin, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, Cook County Commissioner, formerly worked for Congressman Davis, Congressman Rush, Senator Mosley Braun. So you've been a part of the Illinois political and policy scene for a long time. Absolutely. Now, I just want to set the, I bought this cigar in DuPage County because the tobacco <laughs> taxes are too high. This is not a sugary drink, technically, <laughs> as covered by the ordinance. Uh, so I just want, you know, I can't afford soda in Cook anymore, so I just drink scotch. Okay. Uh, so why don't we start there because this has been really a remarkable issue from my perspective too. I'm surprised. I'm surprised at the public response, the public opposition, to this Cook County sugary uh, uh, beverage drink tax that was imposed. I think Cook County Board President Preckwinkle is surprised. And so uh, were you surprised by the backlash that it generated? Not at all. You this, is, this is reminiscent of the Boston Tea Party Revolution where, you know, people, the king imposed that tax on tea and people began to pour tea into the river. And quite frankly, I think that uh, this is even worse than that because it's a penny per ounce. And so people cannot even enjoy their sweetened beverages. Also, the way in which it's implemented and rolled out has been done in a very bad way. I mean, uh, to tax diet soda, which has no sugar, and which has no calories, and then to, you know, basically say that this tax is all about protecting the health of children and reducing obesity in Cook County is just outright uh, insulting to our intelligence as people. I mean, quite frankly, if you're concerned about my health and if you're concerned about obesity, eliminate the food deserts that exist in many of these communities throughout the city of Chicago and throughout Cook County. Make sure that uh, parents have the wherewithal. So provide grants for people to do public health education. Make sure that parents can teach their children to make better choices and then make sure that those choices are there to be made. But government should never impose regressive taxes like these that, you know, strike at the very heart of uh, our ability to choose what it is that we want to drink and that sort of thing. The other thing that I would say is this. A lady in Oak Park wrote me a letter the other day. She said, Commissioner, I'm outraged by this tax. She says, I don't drink much soda. But she says, I'm a marathon runner. And she says, I run between 15 and 20 miles a week. She says, I'm outraged that Gatorade is being taxed as a part of the sweetened beverage tax. She says, the Gatorade helps my body to recover from losing so many, you know, valuable. The electrolytes and yes, all that. Yes, that sort of thing. And so she says, sugar and snacks have more, uh, well, cereal and snacks have more sugar content in them then in fact many cans of soda and so i checked i went to the grocery store and i checked and actually a lot of the cereal that our children eat has more sugar way more sugar than soda pop and these candy bars candy bars have way more sugar well sure and many well of that's these, uh, one of the aspects of this is the arbitrary nature of it what's on the list and what isn't right. if you prepare the frappuccino at Starbucks it's not that you don't have to impose the tax if you buy it in a bottle you the tax is imposed I mean all of this uh, the fact that uh, persons purchasing these items with link cards are exempted right. that so then so then you're not concerned about their health <laughs> if you're making the health argument it's all very confusing um, but I, I, if you weren't surprised how was it that uh, Tony Preckwinkle and others who voted for it, some of whom are your erstwhile political allies on a range of other issues, how, how were they surprised? Because Tony Preckwinkle went from untouchable to very mortal in about 60 days after this was imposed, politically. Well, look, I, I think that it's a total misread of the public, and I think that they didn't listen to the public when we did those budget uh, hearings around the county. I listened to my district, I listened to the people in my district, and quite frankly, uh, the overwhelming majority of the people in my district are opposed to this kind of tax. And you can't really articulate to the people why we really need it. Well, this, so this is the thing. So uh, this is supposed to generate, you know, projected with kind of the typical government static analysis, like people's demand for these things is inelastic, which it's not. but. Well, how much money is it supposed to? 200 million. And so when, what's the county budget? 
the county budget right now is $4.8 billion. Right. So people hear those numbers and they say, so let me just understand something. Um, in a county budget of round numbers, $5 billion, you can't find less than 5% right. of spend to reduce to close whatever budget deficit you're projecting for the forthcoming fiscal year. That's a difficult case to make, I think, in terms of people's understanding of government in the state of Illinois generally on the spend side versus the revenue side. It's always kind of revenue solves all the problems and government never seems to be interested in rethinking and re-engineering the way that it spends the limited resources that people have to finance it. Look, I've, I've been dismayed as I've watched uh, Tony Preckwinkle unravel. Um, it began with the sales tax increase. I voted against that too because I, it's another regressive kind of tax. Right. That hurts. She, she rolled it back. Right. Now she, what she ran on, right. and then she rolled it forward. Right. Uh -huh, the right. old two step. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, you know, quite frankly, she told a number of people, including me, that uh, we wouldn't need any additional revenue if we raised the sales tax by a penny, making us the highest sales tax in the United States of America. We wouldn't need any more revenue. But then we come a year later, or a year and a half later, and she says, look, we need $200 million in revenue. And guess what? I want to implement the soda pop tax. This is the way to get it. And I automatically said, no, this is outrageous. I mean, you can't just single out an industry and say, look, you're an easy target and we're going to go after you and we're going to make you part of the sin taxes. I thought that that was a bad deal for them. But also when you look at, and I agree with you, I put forward a 10 point plan. We need to reinvent county government. We need to remake county government. This is our opportunity. When the judge imposed the TRO, the temporary restraining order, she sent out 400 plus layoff notices to people, basically saying that the sky is falling, we have a calamity in county government. Now, you mean to tell me, and, and, and that for that amount, we're supposed to get like 60 some million dollars. We don't have 60 some million dollars in reserves that can float the county for the rest of the fiscal year through November 30th, you know, without having everything come to a screeching halt or saying we gotta lay people off. I mean, it sent chills and shocks up the, the spines of many of the employees in county government. Although one might argue, and I will, that uh, perhaps the county government could exist with a few less picnic table inspectors and other positions in county government. Look, and I, I agree with you, and, but part of the problem is, is that President Preckwinkle has always had this go-it-alone approach. She's never been one to collaborate with others. And quite frankly, she doesn't even collaborate with the commissioners who are elected by district, 17 of us, to represent the interests of our constituents. For example, one of the things that, that bothered me greatly is that after the judge lifted the TRO, county won the lawsuit, so we get to collect the sweet and beverage tax. Well, a few days later, she actually instructed the state's attorney, which is our attorney, we pay for him, the taxpayers, to sue, countersue, Irma for $17 million. The Retail Merchants Trade Association. Right, and she did that without even notifying the board, without even asking the board. And if we're in such a fiscal crisis, why would we turn around and, and use our manpower, our tax dollars, to file a countersuit against the retail merchants? Look, it basically sends a chilling effect among people who might want to take on the county or object to an ordinance and say, we think it's unconstitutional. Well, they may think twice now because they may think, well, the county's going to turn around and sue us. So I don't think any one person should be able to take county government into a lawsuit and bind the taxpayers to a lawsuit. So I put forward an ordinance with several of my colleagues that would require her to actually get permission from the board before we take the county into a lawsuit. Well, that's it. I mean, it, it smacks of the kind of the ruling class mentality. Irma filed a legitimate suit, uh, even though the, the judge lifted the temporary restraining order. It's still a legitimate suit under the Illinois Constitution and a colorable claim they're making. You're an attorney. You understand right. this. And, and she files a frivolous suit in response to be punitive, which she later withdraws because of the firestorm it created because it had no legal merit. And it right. was exactly what you say, just her saber rattling and say, you sue me, I sue you. 
I mean, this is the kind of leadership you get from the chief executive of uh, one of the largest local units of government in the country? Second largest local unit of government. And so it's very troubling to me. I mean, I'm very concerned about what I see happening. And I'm also very concerned about the budget. Look, a few months ago, President Preckwinkle was interviewed, and she talked about, uh, they asked her, why did you vote against Mayor Daley's budgets constantly when you were in the city council? And she because said, I, that's how you told me to? No, she, she said, said, I voted against them because the executive has the ability to hide millions of things in the budget, and we'll never figure it out as aldermen how to where things are really going and so taking that logical reasoning that she said well now she's the executive and quite frankly i believe she's not being transparent with the people of cook county and i believe she's misleading uh, commissioners saying one thing but there's another thing in that budget that we're unaware of and so it's like you know if if she's actually put out a, a statement basically saying that, look, if the sweet and beverage tax is rolled back, uh, I'm asking each agency to cut 11% from their budget. 11% across the board cuts. One, I think that's draconian. I don't think you do things that way. You roll up your sleeves and you go to work. You do the real work. You figure out how do you right size every agency of county government? How do you have zero base budgeting? How do you go back and you make sure that these, uh, these people actually need it and that, that we're being efficient and effective for the taxpayer? And then how do you close and eliminate these uh, open and vacant positions that exist in county government, some 1,500 positions that are budgeted for? How do we deal with the issues of gun violence that's uh, costing us hundreds of millions of dollars? Uh, just this year alone, so far, it's costing, costed us more than $40 million at Stroger Hospital to treat gun violence victims just so far this year, 40 million plus. The medical examiner has to conduct an autopsy on every gun violence victim, every gun violence death. We've had over 500 people killed this year by gun violence. That's taxpayer money. Last year, over 800 people killed. All of these costs go up and they continue to mount. 76% of the shooters are going unprosecuted, they're mm -hmm. not being caught by the right. Chicago Police Department, and so they're causing mayhem in maybe about 10 to 12 communities across the city. It's costing taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars. Including some of the communities you represent. Absolutely. Austin, West Garfield, West Humboldt Park, uh, out in Maywood. I mean, and, and I'm very concerned about this. Look, government's first obligation is to protect the people that we represent to make sure that those folks, those children, those senior citizens are free from gun violence, are free from the threat of terror and that sort of thing. I mean, basically when you have people who walk, who go down the street in, in a car and they shoot up, you know, shooting at somebody and they hit a grandparent on the porch, that's terrorism. Or they shoot into a crowd and they hit a, a, a baby or hit a young person, that's terrorism. And we have to go after these folks and we have to prosecute them and we have to make sure that these individuals, you know, do the time I want to get, protect I, our communities. I do want to talk about violence, but I want to just close the loop on the uh, sugary beverage tax. It's just, you compared it to the Tea Party, so this is a huge issue. I, I, <laughs> this has captivated the imagination of Cook County taxpayers against uh, county government and against kind of the political ruling class generally. I don't think it's limited to county government. I think it's sort of a last straw thing, um, but including in minority communities. Uh, for, for certain, in a way that a lot of issues you would think would captivate them haven't, including violence. Right. And so uh, there was the possibility of repealing the tax increase back in September. That was kicked till uh, October. So handicap for us whether or not this sugary beverage tax is going to be repealed. I think we repeal it by a vote of uh, 9 or 10. So that's not a veto proof. No, it's not veto proof. Uh, in fact, uh, someone told me today that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a partner at a big law firm, and so um, my law firm uh, does minimal legal work uh, for uh, PepsiCo, uh, and we've made less than $10,000 on fees. It's a big law firm. I got 800 partners, 800 lawyers at the firm, and, and 13 offices around the country. 
So it's a big firm. But uh, someone told me today that uh, President Preckwinkle has requested a state's attorney opinion on whether or not I should even be voting on this sure. and whether I should recuse myself. So what I've done is I've taken it a step further and basically said to the management committee that any uh, revenue generated from representation of Pepsi, Coca-Cola, I don't want any share of those revenues uh, at the end of the year when partners get their disbursement. So I basically walled myself off from that. But the think. But, 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 uh, but now the millions of dollars in advertisements and the political capital that Michael Bloomberg has to support Tony Preckwinkle, the, this gambit, <laughs> Um, that that does that presents no conflicts for her or for others that are interested in ho uh, holding up this tax for the possibility of the mother's milk of politics, Bloomberg's money. Well, she evidently doesn't think it presents a challenge. Look, a lot of her friends have actually made contributions to my colleagues on the board. One of them recently reported, Hill Hammock, who's the uh, chairman of the health and hospital system, uh, made several thousand dollars in contributions to my colleagues. And uh, his budget, the health and hospital center system budget, actually comes before us in the next month. So county employees we, making donations to county board members, and that's not a conflict. Right. I, so some conflicts are important and other conflicts are less important. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like about the right speed for Cook County government, government and Cook County. But I want to be clear okay. because I want to remove even the hint of impropriety uh, from this. I don't work for PepsiCo, I don't work for Coca-Cola, I work for the people of the first district of Cook County. And quite frankly, that's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna represent their interests on the board. And so if I thought Pepsi or Coke were wrong in this, I'd be the first one against them. And But now you have proposed other tax increases uh, to make up for this tax increase, you, at least in terms of consideration, like increasing the taxes <laughs> on uh, ride sharers, right. ride sharing companies like right. Uber and Lyft, um, make the case for that. Is that not also somewhat of a regressive tax? Well, the reason why it's not a regressive tax is one, they use our roads and our county infrastructure. The uh, city is currently charging a tax on ride share companies, mm -hmm. uh, but the county is not. The county is not also not charging a tax uh, on the marijuana distrib distributors. Uh, but the cities are. I mean, they're, they're in the state. They're receiving revenue from that, but the county is not. And so I think, um, you know, to pay their fair share of using the county infrastructure, the roads and infrastructure in the county, why not? But here's what I'll tell you about that. So, But, but you just said also that we can re-engineer and rethink county government so that we don't have to raise any taxes right. to make, and, to make and so, that. So I basically look, last year, I did propose that as an, as an option. Uh, President Preckwinkle wasn't, didn't want to hear it. We had several votes for it on the board, by the way. But um, uh, one of the lobbyists that she actually used to work for the county uh, lobbies for Uber yeah. and so and Lyft. And so, quite frankly, uh, she brought him back to lobby on the sweetened beverage tax at the county. So that's part of the reason why she didn't want to even deal with that. And so I'm fine with that. But I think that we're able to, to, to cut $200 million out of the budget. It's less than 5% of our total budget without having to go in the taxpayers' pockets again. Now, there's some suggestion that um, one of the best ways that uh, you can make your case and distinguish your viewpoint from President Preckwinkle's viewpoint is to actually run against her in the Democrat primary for Cook County Board President. Now, you've recently taken your name out of the mix right. for a potential primary challenge, why? Well, look, I, every decision uh, that I make, every move I make was being viewed from the lens of running for president of the county board. I did not think that was right. I did not think it was fair. And so I'm able to speak out. I'm able to use my voice to make my case uh, without having the burden or the lens of running for president. I'm running for re-election. Look, I, I think I, we looked at it long and hard. We talked to a lot of people. And I think that my highest and best use as a public official is to represent the first district of Cook County on the county board. Let me talk a, a little bit about some other things that uh, county government has been promulgating. 
in a, you know, a county over a million people, that's the only county in the country, that big losing population. Yes. And uh, you know what the south suburbs look like, demilitarized them because property taxation is so confiscatory, it's driven companies out of the south suburbs into Will County, into northwest Indiana, and that's happening statewide. But Cook County is particularly suffering the effects. I mean, the highest, this is just jarring to me, so I say it as much as possible, the highest property tax rate as a percentage of home value in Cook County, Fort Heights. One of the poorest communities in the Cook County, in Illinois, in the country, precluding home ownership for low income minority families, black families in Fort Heights, to get on the rungs of the ladder to climb up and access uh, you know, independent, successful life where you can build assets and wealth and, and pass it on to your children and all the things that every family wants to do. It's uh, immoral the property tax, uh, taxation system in Cook County from my point of view and it's destroying the county and it's destroying the possibility of businesses to locate here or the ones here to stay or much less to expand and yet Cook County the same summer with the increase in the or the introduction of the sugary beverage tax is promulgating the $13 minimum wage which two excuse me three quarters of Cook County municipalities have opted out of is promulgating managing businesses sick leave policy and scheduling policy. I mean, we, we're the restaurant capital of the world, and it's like Cook County government, along with its accomplice city government, along with its accomplice state government, wants every productive entrepreneur to get the hell out of here. Uh, what, what about the other policies that have been promulgated by Cook County government, this Preckwinkle administration, with the support of a lot of Cook County board members on sick leave, on minimum wage? These are not job creating, opportunity inducing uh, public policies. Let, let me say this. I believe that we have to have a pro-business growth strategy for Cook County. That's part of my 10-point plan. And the reason being is because we've lost more population than any other county in the United States of America. But that's been a combination of things. It's been a combination of the, the violence that exists, the lack of opportunity that exists in many of these communities on the south and west sides of Chicago and many of the communities in suburban Cook. Um, the fact that we've made the county less competitive. I'm concerned about this property tax issue, this, um, this, this Tribune article series about the tax divide was real. And quite frankly, uh, President Preckwinkle's response to it was let's have another study. We've had three studies about the unfair property tax assessment system that the assessor is using in Cook County that basically assesses properties in poor communities at a higher assessed value than in those properties in wealthier communities. And so I'm very concerned about it. And, and that's with Cook County, unlike the other 101 counties in Illinois, having commercial property taxpayers subsidize residential property taxpayers in terms of how they're assessed. Right. Even with that, you can't, you can't, you'd be out of your mind to buy a home in some of the neighborhoods you mentioned on the west side of Chicago that you represent because it's impossible to return on, to get a return on investment. You're paying for your home three and four times in property taxes alone over the course of a 30 year fixed mortgage. That's a government taking. That's taking somebody's private property, the largest investment most people will make in their lives. And I just don't hear the outrage from your party. I'm not putting you on as the spokesman of your party, but I just don't hear the outrage for people that are being marginalized in Cook County from home ownership, in addition to the highest black unemployment in the country, in the city of Chicago, in the county of Cook. Right. Um, you know, at some point, uh, you're welcome to come over if you'd like to switch parties and uh, help to lead the revolt in Cook County from, you know, a Republican perspective. Well, Dan, they're already calling me Republican. You do know that, right? Well, I, that, I mean, that's, that's been the knock on me well, well, by you President Preckwinkle and others that I side too often with Republicans. Well, you don't have, you don't have to treat that as a knock. That's a compliment <laughs> with respect to the policies they're proposing. You should say thank you, President Preckwinkle. Well, let me tell you, this isn't about party. This is about people. It's about policy. And, and, and it's about people's pocketbooks. It's about their opportunities. It's about making sure that they're safe in their neighborhoods. And it's about making sure that they have the best performing schools that they can possibly have. And so quite frankly, I'm fighting hard to make sure that we have a fair property tax assessment system.
I, what about what about here? So here's a proposal. Just you know where all our, our businesses are going in Cook County, Northwest Indiana. You know what their property tax system is in, in Northwest in, in the state of Indiana. One percent hard cap on residential property taxes as a percentage of home value. Full stop. Shall not increase unless you uh, improve your property or sell it. In other words, have a capital event. Why can't we adopt that here? I mean, you have these uh, homeowners in South Suburban Cook. I mean, frankly, even, you know, your Champagne Socialist neighbors in Oak Park, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, in the nuclear free zone in which you live, um, you know, they're getting hammered too. They might not realize that they may be insulated from caring because of their wealth, but I mean, they are getting hammered. They're not getting a return on their home either because it's four and five times what a similar situated home in Indiana would be paying in property taxes. And of course, you understand the negative multiplier effect of taking people's home equity through taxation. Right. So what about doing something, proposing something that is really system changing, paradigm changing, as opposed to kind of the, the language we hear from politicians in both parties all the time for the last 30 years, freeze this and we're working on it and we're a study, like you said, Preckwinkle wanted to do. And, you know, we want things to be fair and they're not fair. It's like, look, Chicago Democrats have been in charge of Cook County since Ogilvy in 19 was elected in 66. They've been in charge of the city of Chicago for 100 years. When is the probationary period over? Well, what I would say to you is this: one, I think you have to do that in Springfield. In part, tax. in part, but you can you can leave but, from Cook County in Chicago. It's got a lot of political clout here. Right, but what we've done in Cook County, we haven't raised the property taxes in Cook County. Uh, in years, certainly since I've been on the board the last three years, there hasn't been a property tax vote to come up to raise property taxes in the county. I'd never vote for something like that. I think it'd be crazy. I mean, you know what the people are paying out in the south suburbs? I, I met a gentleman while I was going throughout the county who actually is paying more in property taxes than he is for his mortgage. That's, that's everywhere. And I think it's outrageous. Yeah. And so we, we, we do need some relief there. The homeowners need relief there. We can agree on that. Uh, there are a number of areas where we what, what about, I think that we got to bring businesses back to Cook County. What about those work rules I mentioned, the, you know, mandating sick I leave voted, and all look, that stuff? Look, I voted for the minimum wage increase, and I voted for the paid sick leave. And, and let me tell you why I did. One, because I do think that people need to make a little bit more money. And I think that once they make more money, they're going to spend it. Uh, but I think that that's an issue that needs to be dealt with at the state level. I think that it needs to be across the board or at the federal level, where it's an across the board minimum wage increase for workers. They haven't had that in years, especially at the federal level. How do you respond to the three quarters of municipalities that opted out? They don't care about workers? Look, no, I, I, I don't say that they don't care about workers. I think that they're doing what's best for their community. And that's why there was an opt-out provision in the legislation, because obviously uh, municipalities have to do what's best for their community. I represent uh, seven municipalities. Six of the seven opted out of it. Oak Park remained in. They were one vote short of opting out, actually. Mm -hmm. But in some of my municipalities, and I talked to some of the mayors, they said, look, a lot of our major uh, job creators uh, manufacturing companies has said that if we don't opt out, they're going to pull out, they're going to leave. And they've been here for like 30 years. They're going to leave. They're going to take their business somewhere else because they don't want to be uh, impacted by these onerous requirements. And so quite frankly, there was an opt-out provision there, uh, you know, for communities. Well, right. So... Why did you vote for it? If you under, you look, you're a smart guy. Right. You understand economics because as good as any of those mayors do. Because fundamentally, I agree that people ought to make more money. I agree with the minimum wage. Well, yeah, but you can't tax. mandate people making more money. I mean, you're, you're, it, where is the county, where is the county government's business to tell a manufacturer how to run his manufacturing company or a restaurant to tell a, a restaurateur how to run his restaurant? I mean, you, you wouldn't want somebody to come and tell your law firm how much to pay you. Right. I understand that. But let me say this that there hasn't been a minimum wage increase for years. Yeah, but it's bad the, public the, policy. The, the, the state has debated it. They've considered it. I think the governor has rejected it several times. Um, but the people deserve to have an increase. And so, and the other thing about the paid sick leave is what you want someone who's actually sick serving you at a restaurant and they got a cold or something and they're sneezing all over your food 
and then they deliver it to you, and, and you wind up getting sick. Yeah, but, okay, come on, though. I'm, so, I'm just saying. But so, so the restaurateur doesn't, the, you care more about the restaurateur's patrons than he or she does. Come on. No, we care about people. Well, I know. We well, how about, about the, the, the business owner and the staff are in the best position <laughs> to make those decisions than, you know, 17 Cook County commissioners. I mean, I hate to break it to you. And the reason you're laughing is because you know I'm right. That's why you're laughing. <laughs> I'm laughing because I think it's an interesting debate. Yes, yeah, well. But okay. quite frankly, at the end of the day, it's going to be decided, I think, by the state or by the federal government. And I, look fundamentally believe that people ought to make more money. And so, well, I, I want people to make more money too. I want everybody to make a million bucks, but I can't wave a wand and do it. I mean, that's the, the, the hubris of government, particularly in this city and state. Here's the funny thing about this, right? Highest black unemployment, one of the worst cities for uh, violent crime, as you were talking about, and it impacts your district too. And even if it didn't, I know you'd care about it because it's other human beings whose lives are being taken. Um, these shooting galleries on the west side and the south side of Chicago, are it, it is it is intolerable and yet it's all you know here's what you get from the political class in in the county it's democrats they, they run the show and they have for generations and generations it's not as bad as you think uh, a lot of blame to go around and we're working on it and no. generation after generation of families pass through this never getting the opportunities that everybody says they deserve to be able to access they don't. They don't have good schools. They don't have safe neighborhoods. They have food deserts in their neighborhoods. They don't have good job opportunities that put them not just for a job, but on a path to a career. And meanwhile, you're squeezing them at every turn with confiscatory taxation. And it's kind of the whole like, I agree, this is all so bad. We should do something about it, like you're innocent bystanders. The people in charge are not innocent bystanders. They're the people in charge. Here, here's what I've said, Dan. And I've probably been the leading voice on this gun violence in the county and in the city, Chicago. I've said we have a virtual state of emergency and we've been in that for the last three years since I've been in office on the west and south sides of Chicago. I mean where you have six, seven hundred people killed a year. It's like a war zone. You have more people killed here in Chicago in one city than in Iraq. I mean it's like a war zone and so we must put some serious attention on it. I've tried to get uh, Governor Rauner, Mayor Emanuel, President Preckwinkle to declare a state of emergency relative to the gun violence. And they said, well, what would that do? Well, one, it would put the spotlight on the issue. It would say, hey, we're very concerned about what's happening here. Two, maybe resources would flow. Maybe we get more FBI agents. Maybe we get more DEA agents. Uh, maybe we would have a situation where people would be able to solve some of these violent crimes, these gun violence crimes that are, that, that are happening in these communities. I think it's terrible. I think elected officials have basically failed the people when it comes to the fact of protecting them. If this was an existential threat, a foreign threat, uh, we would do everything that we have to do to protect them. Homeland Security, we'd make sure that we got as much money to protect us from ISIS and all of these existential uh, terrorists. But let me tell you, if America is to fall, America will not fall because of an existential threat. We won't fall because of North Korea. We'll fall because of something internal that happened. That's what happened to Rome, to the Roman Empire. I mean, they didn't fall because of an external threat. They fell because of the the excesses, the things that happened internal. And that's the same with America. We'll fall because, one, we haven't provided the opportunities for African Americans. We, we've left them out, we've left them behind, and that's not the way America ought to operate. We shouldn't have the highest unemployment among African Americans. We ought to be making sure that people have opportunities for work. This is important. So, they, so the civilian political leadership in this city and county has failed? I'm telling you that the elected leadership has failed and the people have failed to hold the elected representatives accountable. So, so Rahm Emanuel should go. Tony Preckwinkle should go. It's time for somebody else. Members of the city council need to be turned out. Members of the county board need to be turned out. We need to have people that are willing to take political risks to chart a different course in the city and county, when it, whether it comes to job opportunities or 
uh, safety of neighborhoods. Is that a fair statement? I think what is fair is that the people will ultimately decide who their elected officials are. I know, are. but what do you think? And I'm telling you what I think. I listen to the people. And what I also think is that we have some serious crisis, a serious issue going on relative to this gun violence. I believe it's the number one issue in our community. I believe it's the number one issue in the county and in the state and in the city. When you look at the costs from this gun violence, not just the cost of uh, losing lives, but when you look at the other costs, uh, the, the, the cost of, you know, earners. I mean, people who could have contributed to our society, people who could have created a business sure. to, to create jobs and that sort of thing. It's not just the people murdered. I mean, you know, uh, Dean Angelo, former head of the FOP, used to make this point all the time. If you included the people that were injured uh, that with, through uh, gun violence, you're talking about um, 5,000 people. And, you know, a, a gunshot is a catastrophic injury, a gunshot yes, wound. And so this is not something that, you know, you, you fell down a flight of stairs and you're on crutches for two weeks. I mean, these are catastrophic injuries, life-changing injuries. And so the, the costs that they impose and the opportunities they preclude are exponentially higher than are reported. Yes. And so, um, you know, I go back again to say, uh, who should, I mean, you're an elected official and you're an intellectual and political leader. If you're telling people, I want to hold somebody accountable for what is not being done. I'm telling you, you have to hold elected officials accountable. But the way that you do that is you register, you organize, and you go out and you vote. And you put people in who are going to take care of your community, who are going to actually make you a priority who are going to protect your pocketbook at every cost, who are going to make sure that you have opportunities, that you have jobs, that you have safe neighborhoods, and that you have schools that work. That's what you do. And when it comes to schools that work, just to, to tackle that issue as well, um, what, what is your assessment of the job that uh, Rob Emanuel, Force Claypool, Karen Lewis, and the Teachers Union have done to uh, make sure neighborhood schools are providing the kinds of educational opportunities that the selective enrollment in private schools are providing to disproportionately minority children in Chicago. Look, what I'd say to you is this, that the county has very little role in terms of public education. I know, I'm asking as, as an American <laughs> citizen. I'm asking as a concerned citizen, not as a Cook County Commissioner. Because you care about more than I just what happened. this was about the county. You can't. Well, but I mean, I could, you're, you're could be, you know, you could be governor someday. I don't know what you're going to run for. So let's let's hear. I mean, you're as I don't have to continue to um, compliment you. You know these issues. You pay attention to the stuff. You care about the stuff. You're voicing your concern for this stuff. So that necessarily carries an assessment of the people in charge, how well they're doing. I think there are serious problems with the education of our children. Uh, in too many of these neighborhoods. And oftentimes they're in neighborhoods that are overwhelmingly poor and African American. And I think we have to figure out a way, we have to figure out strategies to make sure that these schools, each one of them, are performing optimal. And our kids are learning. And we have a curriculum that's dynamic. Not one that turns people off and not one that leads African American boys to drop out of school at a faster rate than anybody else in the United States of America. And so we have to figure out how do we do that and how do we work together to make that happen. Uh, so go back to the county. I want to end on a, a positive note, or at least the opportunity for one among all the <laughs> everything that's so dismal that's happening in the state. I mean, You've got to be hopeful. Well, I am hopeful. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. But I mean, I'm kind of like... Put it, I'm like Whitaker Chambers. Put in the fight expecting you're going to lose. Maybe you win. Maybe you're wrong. Maybe you surprise yourself. Right. That's kind of what happened to Whitaker Chambers, although he didn't live a particularly happy life. So <laughs> in that way, I'm like Whitaker Chambers, too. Uh, but here's the thing. No, um, a, 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 a positive note, because uh, I'm a longtime critic of county government because it deserves it, of course. Mm -hmm. But in your three years, to point to something where you have been able to spearhead or collaborate on a positive reform in county government that's, yeah, and maybe if it's a little thing, but it speaks to big possibilities. Look, uh, one of the things that we were able to do is we actually, there was a tax on women hygiene products, uh, you know, feminine hygiene products. Yes. We actually passed the bill, the ordinance, to actually stop taxing those products in Cook County. 
and then the state picked up the bill and they passed it statewide and so yes. we believe and that was my legislation okay. so we actually believe that uh, we we saved women on their health care uh, costs and their feminine hygiene products that they purchase uh, you know on a monthly basis and right. I think that's good I think that's good government I think it's good for women I think it's good for the county and, uh, and then we just ha turn around and hammer them when they go to Starbucks <laughs> to make up the difference. I didn't do it. No, I, I I'm not saying I'm not blaming and, you. And let me tell you something. Come October 10th, I'm confident that we'll have the votes to repeal this tax. Whether or not uh, President Preckwinkle vetoes it, it's her decision to make there. I would caution her and urge her not to veto it, but to accept the will of the body and the will of the people. If, she, if, it, if it is repealed and she vetoes it, are you going to reconsider running for Cook County Board President? Look, um, I've made my decision. My decision is to run for re-election. Okay. All right. He is Cook County Commissioner Richard Boykin, Cook County Commissioner for now. Richard Boykin, thanks so much for joining us on this edition of Against the Current. Thank you.